I'll do just a quick welcome to everyone. Uh, I'm Kara Sarah with the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council, and I'm joined by my colleagues Ashley Mott, who is our GIS planner, and Amy Bidwell, who is a hazard mitigation planner. Um, and we're here to talk about our project, which we call T-Brick, or the Tampa Bay Regional Inundation Coordination Project. Um, Sean is Sean Lahav is with our consultant Hoff and Associates, and then uh, he has uh, with him Taylor Engineering. Um, I know Sean is going to introduce his team, um, and uh, I did want to um, just thank everyone for joining the call. We really hope that this project is going to be a really um, useful resource for you as you're conducting your vulnerability assessments. All right. Well, thank you, Kara. And before getting started with the presentation, I'd also like to give Guillermo Simone from HAF an opportunity just to welcome everyone. He's our project manager. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, it's just good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, for having us. Uh, we're going to run through uh, some slides uh, today. I think uh, we set aside two hours for the meeting, though I doubt that we're going to take that long. Uh, feel free to ask questions. Um, you know, we'll keep it very, um, you know, very informal, but hopefully very informative. Um, we'll pass the um, pass the baton here with the slides uh, internally. So. Um, uh, just, uh, you know, the goal is to explain what we did, the uh, the products that are available for uh, for you all. And um, and that's that. Thank you for having us uh, today. All right. Well, thank you, Guillermo. And that said, we're about to get started. So I will share our screen. All right. So welcome to the webinar. We've been waiting for this for quite a while now, and we're really excited to unveil the final product of this really exciting project that we believe is innovative and is gonna push the Tampa Bay region to the next level. So the name of this project is Tampa Bay Regional Inundation Coordination, also referred to by the acronym of TBRIC. And this is the final technical assistance webinar. We're wrapping up the project this month. So we really appreciate all of the stakeholders who have joined us today for this meeting. So before diving into all of the resources and tools that will be made available through this project, we first want to establish context regarding why this project came to fruition to begin with and what were really the background components. And so as many folks in this webinar are aware, the Resilient Florida program established in 2021 awarded a grant to the TBRPC in 2022 to develop a unified approach to flood inundation mapping for the Tampa Bay region. And really wanna put emphasis on the word mapping here. Uh, this product or this project did not engage in any new modeling efforts, but we wanted to look at existing mapping products and how we could compile and take that into a spatial form. After a competitive bidding process, the TBRPC selected half to implement the project. We are joined by Taylor Engineering, who has supported the project as a subconsultant. And then most interestingly, the University of Florida was hired by the TBRPC to function as an independent third party reviewer. So all of the resources and tools developed as part of this project were reviewed both by Taylor Engineering and the University of Florida after internal QAQC with half. The project started in the spring, so it was a very quick turnaround. Uh, it was about you know three to four months, and final deliverables for the TBRIC project will be submitted to the FDEP in June 2023. And in terms of you know the reasons why this project was made possible to begin with, or what are the reasons why this project uh, was sponsored by FDEP? So across the state of Florida and across the Tampa Bay region, local governments, counties, municipalities are using inconsistent methodologies and models to conduct their vulnerability assessments. And it's not necessarily that one, one method is right or one method is wrong. It's more of the fact that everyone's approaching it from a different, uh, you know, the way I describe it as a sheet of music. And so the purpose of this project is to get everyone on the same page. There's also a lot of governments across the Tampa Bay region and other parts of the state that are only now beginning to look at vulnerability assessments. They have less resources. And so through this regional project, we're trying to give local governments the most recently available data and how it should be interpreted. And all of this is really intended to ensure regional consistency 
Uh, you know, moving into the future, especially as it relates to grant funding and going after federal grants, uh, there has to be an understanding that everyone is looking at this from the same perspective. And this project will provide resources for member governments to meet the requirements of statute and the FDEP Resilient Florida program. And as many of you are aware, you know, the Tampa Bay region uh, after Hurricane Ian uh, was spared, it, it actually, you know, everything drained out uh, from Tampa Bay. But this is an image just showing some of the vulnerabilities present in the Tampa Bay region. Uh, water is surrounding everywhere, critical roadways, critical infrastructure assets. There are so many vulnerable assets because of storm surge, flooding, and other factors. And so this image really represents a, a, a huge purpose of the project. It's to understand where these vulnerabilities are and, and how the TBRPC can assist local governments in navigating those vulnerabilities. So with that said, I'd like to introduce the project team that was involved in TBRIC and what each of these individuals roles encompassed. So Guillermo Simone, he is a coastal engineer with HAF based out of Jacksonville, Florida, a great friend of mine. He was the project manager in charge of overseeing the entire project. Samuel Ada is a GIS professional based out of Texas. He was a senior technical advisor on this project and really led the development of this mapping tool. And then Sam Sarkar, also based out of Texas, led the research and development of some innovative uh, resources as well as contributed to the tool itself that we will highlight later in this presentation. A lot of you are familiar with me from past presentations, but again, my name is Sean Lahav, Senior Resilience Planner with HAF. And the focus of my position within this project was on stakeholder engagement, interviewing subject matter experts and engaging stakeholders from across the region. From Taylor Engineering, we had a diverse crew, uh, but I'd like to give a shout out to Dr. Angela Shadell, who helped us with some regional guidance and best practices. And then as mentioned previously from the University of Florida, our third party review team, we had Dr. Katie Serafin and Crystal Goodison who helped us out with this effort. Uh, much thanks is given to them. It wouldn't have been possible without their contributions. And then most importantly, we would also like to acknowledge the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. Kara, Ashley and Amy were fantastic partners to work with on this entire effort and they provided invaluable feedback every, every week as we were navigating this process. So really this slide is intended to show that this was a collaborative effort. A lot of people were involved, a lot of passionate people, and we were really excited about all of, all of this project. So moving forward, we'd like to discuss project goals from the onset, and then that'll guide the rest of the discussion as we highlight projects. So the first goal of this project was to develop a unified approach to inundation mapping and vulnerability assessments for the Tampa Bay region. Now, this is a very big task. There's a lot involved here, but we believe that the resources made available through TBRIC is the first starting point for launching that discussion. This is gonna be a continuous discussion over the next several years. Not everything is gonna be solved immediately. So this is something that the Tampa Bay region and local governments are gonna to have to discuss and reach consensus on over time. Towards the beginning of the process, our goal was to research and compile recommendations and best practices. The way that we achieved this was by conducting interviews with subject matter experts from academia, industry, and the public sector to obtain insights related to best practices, challenges, and opportunities. And that's something we'll highlight in a few moments. And then over the past few months, we facilitated virtual workshops with experts and stakeholders from across the region and elsewhere to discuss inundation mapping methods, data needs, and gaps. And then most importantly, as it relates to the goals and objectives of this project, our, our core objective, and this is what Sam Ada and Sam Sarkar will highlight later, was to develop a GIS geoprocessing tool that could take inputs from a diversity of sources and shoot out flood maps in a quick and cost-effective manner. So this is the biggest product that was made available through this project. And you know, tying all of these goals together is section 380.093 Florida statute. And these are the statutory requirements that address how vulnerability assessments need to be conducted according to the state of Florida and FDP. 
And so that's what really ties all of this together. That's the core motivation. So moving forward, we're gonna give an overview of the project, what was involved in the scope of work. And then I will highlight some of the, the tasks that were engaged early on to engage stakeholders. So looking at the scope of work, this was a four phase project. Phase one or task one was focused on defining best practices through interviews with subject matter experts. Task two was focused on stakeholder coordination. So we facilitated three webinar events virtually with different stakeholder groups, the TBRPC, Tampa Bay Estuary Program. And this is where we, we tried to engage stakeholders from across the region, give them an understanding or a preliminary understanding of what we were trying to accomplish, and then also collect input and feedback into how to improve the process and how to make it applicable to local needs and priorities. And then finally, task four is regional technical assistance. The webinar that we are on today was made possible through this last task of the project, but beyond the webinar, there will be additional technical assistance resources including a user's guide and manual for the tool, a crosswalk, all sorts of things that we'll highlight throughout this webinar. And so when we're looking at defining best practices, our objective was to look at the products and outcomes that would be made possible through the TBRIC project. And so to highlight some of these, and we'll showcase these throughout the webinar, there are five core resources made available through TBRIC. The first is a subject matter expert interviews report. And the interviews report highlights all of the outcomes from the subject matter expert interviews. Uh, they're about you know, one page each and tries to capture a summary of what was discussed during those meetings and what were some of the big picture takeaways. Then our team produced a regional inundation data crosswalk. And so when we're looking at Florida statutory requirements for vulnerability assessments, there are requirements for tidal flooding, precipitation, compound flooding, storm surge, sea level rise. And so when we're looking at all of those different variables, the question is, where do you access this data? What is the most applicable data for a context? And so the regional inundation crosswalk is going to be a tool that local governments can use to quickly identify data and determine what's gonna be best for their local priorities. And then as mentioned before, a regional GIS geoprocessing application tool. And then there will be technical assistance resources, including a manual and regional data sets that have already been vetted uh, that can be utilized to look at flood inundation. So going back to task one, uh, this was a really exciting part. Um, you know, outside of my role in the private sector, I'm also in academia as a PhD student. And so this was really engaging to, to interact with all of these, these individuals, uh, many of whom we already had professional relationships with. So over the course of two weeks, our team at HALF and then uh, our, our third party reviewers from the University of Florida, we met with representatives from industry, the private sector, public sector, to engage them on what are the best practices that are out there and what types of challenges are being navigated in the flood mapping and modeling space across Florida and the United States. And so as we conducted these interviews, we grounded the conversation in Florida statutory requirements. We were looking at specific variables that are required in the statute, and we tried to engage folks to determine what their perspectives were and what were some common challenge or themes and patterns that were being observed. And out of this effort, there was this you know, report, as I mentioned before. So this will be available after all deliverables are approved by FDP. But going back to the subject matter experts for a second, I would really like to acknowledge all of the individuals who participated in this process. They volunteered their time, their expertise, and they provided a lot of tremendous insights into what we are navigating across the state of Florida. And in looking at the subject matter expert interviews from a holistic perspective, there were some immediate recommendations that came to light that we would like to highlight for a moment. And this is something that the Tampa Bay region can consider as you all navigate future funding opportunities and as you continue to build consensus. 
And so one of the largest challenges is the fact that federal agencies like NOAA, FEMA, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, they have access to all of this uh, remarkable flood data, but a lot of it is not publicly available. And so from a state of Florida perspective, from a Tampa Bay region perspective, and then looking at the Florida Flood Hub at USF, there is an opportunity to build consensus with these agencies on what data should be made available to local governments to advance the process. One of the lessons that we identified from Southeast Florida, from the South Florida Water Management District, is that I believe a few years ago, they facilitated a multi-jurisdictional workshop with local governments, including municipalities and counties, to compare vulnerability assessment outcomes and determine if there were discrepancies in the methodologies selected for these projects and studies and whether the inundation itself looked different. This is something that the Tampa Bay region should consider. Uh, there's a lot of governments like Pinellas County who are farther along in the process, but then there are other governments that are just now beginning to conduct a vulnerability assessment. So the idea here is once every government in the area has conducted a vulnerability assessment, you could facilitate and conduct a workshop where folks come together to compare those mapping outcomes. And then very similar to the previous recommendations, uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, discrepancies or challenges when we're looking at compound flooding and future precipitation. And so the state of Florida is fortunate that through FDEP and through the state, there is now the Florida Flood Hub at USF. And so there are considerations of, you know, can you make statewide flood modeling products available? Uh, these are all of the things that will be considered after this project. And then to develop regional guidance and materials to inform how vulnerability assessments, especially those that are just now starting out, how those should be conducted and instructions on how to conduct those assessments. So with that said, I am now going to pass it off to Guillermo to talk about the crosswalk, and then we will go into the future with the geoprocessing tool, which will be a really exciting part of this presentation. All right, thanks. Thanks, Sean. So uh, before uh, I dive into the crosswalk, um, so quick uh, quick note about the regional inundation products and geoprocessing tool that uh, that we developed. Um, the uh, the goal of the development of the tool and the data sets that we created is to make that uh, you know a lot of the existing uh, flood data available to uh, everybody in a more consistent way. Uh, so we're leveraging a lot of the uh, riverine and coastal data that already exists, uh, as well as sea level rise, and mapped it on the latest uh, um, the latest lidar that is available. Uh, we also developed this geoprocessing tool, which is a fancy name for a mapping tool in GIS that allows you to allows the user to use your, your newly created data by you know an, an external party it could be cross sections, could be points, could be different formats, and given a topography such as lidar, such as a, any any survey data that uh, somebody collected, a mapping product can be created from that. Um, all of these, um, all of these floodplains, of course, using the tool, it's it's an automated method, so it, it should, they should be considered as an approximate uh, mapping. They need to be reviewed by by an experienced floodplain um, floodplain mapper or an, or an engineer to ensure accuracy. Um, but the tool is fairly uh, fairly powerful. It can create maps in a small scale or a large scale. Uh, can you move to the next slide, please? And we'll we'll uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that tool uh, in the in the upcoming slides. We developed a regional inundation crosswalk, which is it's, it's a table. It's a um, a matrix of information where data related to different flood types is available. Um, the uh, the inundation crosswalk. This is just a snapshot of the crosswalk. It's not the entire uh, table. Uh, but you can see the type of information that is available. Uh, on the left, the flood type, the precipitation, inland flooding, which inland flooding refers to, um, you know, riverine or stormwater flooding, uh, anything that is related to rainfall runoff, uh, sea level change, storm surge, wave effects, compound flooding. 
the table looks uh, at future data for each one of these categories. And as you can imagine, there's, there's some successes and uh, there's some limitations with the availability of future data. Uh, as you can imagine, you know, again, future precipitation is harder to predict at this point than say sea level rise. Sea level rise, we have a ton of measurements along the coast that allow us to make a projection based on, on climate models, but with precipitation, it's a little bit, a little bit harder. Um, but this table summarizes and explains what data uh, is available based on, on the interviews and the research that we completed in the last, in the last uh, few months. And then to talk about the regional data sets, uh, Sam Ara can uh, take it on, uh, take it on from there. All right, thank you, Thanks, Sam. Um So like um, Sean and Guillermo talked about, um, one of the main components of this project was to develop the tool, of course, and how the tool can leverage existing data sets um, to create all this region-wide data um, for mapping. Uh, so really creating data sets was not the primary goal of this project, but as we began to interact with the regional planning, um, they realized that stakeholders and communities want data. So we um, wanted to add value to the product. So we went ahead and started mapping um, across the seven counties um, based on current terrain and like that data that's been um, collected recently. And then we're also going to talk about some of the documentation that goes with the data sets. And then after this, um, Sam will also go into the tool and give an overview of what the tool does. So next slide, please. So um, this is a seven county region. Um, quick overview of the terrain that we leveraged. Um, we've been unlucky to have 2017 to 2018 LIDAR data sets that have been recently acquired. Uh, most of these data sets, you know, have good accuracy, you know, their horizontal range from 0.5 to 1 meter. Um, and then the vertical accuracies are, you know, between 5 centimeters and 10 centimeters. So they are pretty um, accurate for mapping and, you know, do follow the specs, you know, on the federal level when you want to use them for hydraulic studies and mapping. Um, so what we did was we mosaic all these data sets, we quilted them together. Um, and then create a 10-fold resolution DEM. And so all the data products that we did produce um, based on existing um, data is at the resolution of 10-fold. Um, and so this is, this is um, you know, just a snapshot of the terrain that we produce for the whole area. Okay. So next slide. Um, and so quickly, again, the goal was to leverage what's available. And so through the crosswalk, um, and some of the data sets that we've seen within this area, um, we've realized that most of the data that's ex quickly available is FEMA NFHL, the National Flood Hazard Layer, um, and then you know the coastal data that was created on the FEMA effectives are based on the still water elevation. So these were the two main data sets that we actually leveraged um, to start mapping. Now within these data sets, you know, we have cross sections, we've got BFEs, we may have areas of shallow flooding that may have other depths or sheet flow that may have elevations associated with them. Um, we also, of course, have the coastal inundation that comes with the still water elevation. So we've got data that we can easily put into the tool, map it on new terrain, which is a standardized best practice redelineation process where you've got existing data, but you just want to map it on new terrain to see how the mapping is changing um, based on current topography. Um, and so the data that we are creating, we are calling it like a flat quilt because the goal is that once you get more recent and newer data, you can always cut and replace it um, with time. And so since everything is also being stored in a geodatabase like we'll see later on, it becomes very scalable where you can always cut and replace as you get new data. And so on the screen, as you can see, it's just a quick mapping, just straight mapping of existing data. Um, that you can see on the screen um, with a legend that you can see there. So that's a zone AE, um, and then you see a zone A across it. But as you can see there, there's, there's a little lake or pond. So the current um, effective mapping, or when it was mapped at the time, didn't recognize, for example, this um, lake or pond area. 
And so when we began to map on this new LIDAR and new terror, we began to see differences between um, what we are mapping and effective. So if you hit the next, hit um, the next button. Um, and so here's a quick snapshot. Um, so I've just hatched it so we can see the differences. So on the red hatch is where we are adding you know, extra mapping because the new ladder is saying that there's a lake here. So when we map, it covers that lake. Um, so we didn't want to change so much on what people are used to in the national flood hazard layer. Um, so we kept the original flood zone designations. And then we added, for example, where it's mapping, but it's a lake area. We just say X other flood risk areas and we add water bodies to it for quick understanding of what it is. Um, and then if it's just mapping extra 100 year areas or extra 500 year areas, we just say either zone A or zone AE, other flood risk areas or zone X, other flood risk areas, just to show that the new terrain is just saying, you know, there's need this possibility of new mapping of flood risks in these areas because we've got better data now to map with. If you hit the slide again, this is another example where the existing um, zone A mapping right in the middle of the pond there. Um, and then as we begin to map on a new LIDAR, you can see that it gives us a better delineation um, of what the flat rigs and the extent of the flat plane should be. Um, and so um, you're going to be seeing this in the original data sets that um, we, uh, um, we created and uh, sending out to the committees. I'm going to the next slide, please. Um, so overall, um, the goal was to create something that one can be used quickly for vulnerability assessment. Um, so we went ahead and created flat extent polygons. Um, these polygons can easily be intersected with um, existing parcels or building footprints, um, road data sets, anything that we can, we are inventory and we won't be able to see or assess the rigs to flood it. Um, so the polygons um, gives you a quick way to do analysis when you are dealing with flood rigs um, assessment and vulnerabilities. And then we created great data sets. Um, the first set of data sets that we created was what we call the water service elevation grades, where we mapped only the 100 and 500 year rate of returns for this particular exercise. And so we do have the 100 year flood grades and the 500 year flood grades. And then we also created depth. So we got a hundred year depth and we've got a 500 year depth. Um, one of the um, cool things about this is that, so as um, we see on the screen there, the first one was just effective mapping. And then we've got a hatched one, which is what we've mapped now. And so you can see some of the red areas that are high, some of the black areas that this is additional flood risk areas that have been identified. You hit the, um, can you hit it again for me? And so you're going to see an example of the flood grade. Um, as, so on the screen there, you see a BFE of between 30 and 40. Now your water surface elevation grade, um, a mouse pointer there was pointing to about 38.3 um, between those two BFEs. And so it gives you an idea quickly because the grid that I set are based on a 10 foot cell size. Now, instead of just looking at the polygon where it just tells you whether you are in or out of the flood plane, now you begin as a flood plane manager, you begin to realize that, oh, the flood risks actually varies within the flood plane and you're able to see those who are more risks um, than others. Um, and then the, the weasel grade, the water service elevation grade, I think also gives you a quick way to be able to estimate base flood elevations quickly. Um, the way to estimate base flood elevations, you open an FIS, you look at the flood profiles, you have to look at your stationing or your location along the stream, and then be able to, you know, get your um, base flood elevation. Now the water service elevation grades, once you have an address, you type it in, you zoom to the location, you just click on a grid, it quickly gives you your base flood elevation, especially in the zone A areas where you don't have any cross sections, it becomes a very quick tool or quick data set that you can leverage quickly to be able to understand how the elevations are varying within your flood plane. Then the other data set is the depth grades. Now the depth grades are more relatable uh, because when you start talking about base flood elevations, about a certain datum, it's hard for people to understand, okay, what's my risk? Am I going to get three inches of water when it rains, you know, um, in my subdivision? And so the depth grids gives you a way to be able to explain um, flood risks to residents easier. 
um, and then be able to relate it more. So for example, on this um, graphic that you can see, you know, the depth grade is about 0.4, almost, you know, 0.5 of a foot, about six inches. So I can tell the residents, you know, in this area that, hey, you know, when it rains, you know, at a hundred year storm event, you are possibly going to have about six inches um, of water coming into your backyard or, or maybe even your couch might get inundated. So the depth grid is another way that you can, it can help um, communities and floodplain managers and planners be able to visualize the risk and also be able to communicate that risk um, better for um, residents within the communities. Um, again, we are saying this is an, a, a flat quilt. So the whole goal is that you are quilting different data sets. You can't even prioritize the data set. So for example, if you've got FEMA data somewhere, the community has developed their own study. You can quickly map using the tool and then splice this new data into this base data sets that we've um, created. So this is really a foundation-based data for flood risks and vulnerability assessment for the region and can always be built upon when new data sets become available. Um, we are calling these data sets non-regulatory flood quilts. They are not for engineering design or for regulatory purposes. It's just to give us an idea of how the flood risk is changing within this area and how we can um, understand vulnerability and begin to do mitigation efforts and exercises um, with the changing flood risk um, scenarios and conditions. So um, after we've created, you know, these data sets that we are calling existing flood quilts, we began to look at, you know, in terms of future coastal flood data, what's available, how can we map um, coastal inundation also very quickly because we had a very short time um, to show how, you know, things are changing in terms of sea level rise information that's been developed recently. Um, and so people can know the extent. And so we did look at um, sea level rise information that's been developed to, in 2017 from NOAA. Um, and then we leveraged that. And then we looked at the two time horizons, 2014 and 2017. And then we did map the intermediate high and low between these two data sets. Um, and so technically for each county, um, you're going to be getting about eight different coast, future coastal flood data sets because for each time horizon and for the 100 and 500 year, we are mapping the intermediate low and high. Um, again, this gives us a good idea of how coastal flood risk is changing based on sea level rise data and um, how we can better prepare um, just in case anything like that happens. Um, and so if you hit a slide, it will get a, a good grasp of how it's changed. This is an example quickly that we've mapped um, somewhere in Pinellas County where we see the existing coastal mapping based on current data, FEMA, and then mapping it on um, 2070 um, intermediate low and just seeing how it's changing. So there's a significant change once you begin to look at sea level rise um, information and the impact it's going to have in our communities if we don't get ready and find ways to mitigate against those things. So one of the things that we've done with these data sets is to find a way that um, communities are able to leverage it, understand what's in the data sets, it's well documented and it can quickly leverage it for use. Um, and so everything is based on the Esri ArcGIS software. Um, the tool and the files that we've created is based on the newest version called Arc Pro. And so for each data set, we've created a, a map document, um, which is symbolized. So we've tried to symbolize them. It's just basic symbology, but that way, um, people don't have to find a way to symbolize the data set. So we've symbolized all the effective mapping, the depth grades, the whistle grades, um, the, the new mapping too, so that it can easily be um, used and referenced. Everything is a geo, in a geo database. Um, and we've got the vector data sets that I described as the polygons. And then we've got the raster data sets, which are the whistle grades, the water surface elevation grades, and the depth grades um, that can be used. Um, for visualization and understanding of the rest. Um, so if you go into it, so this is an example or it's just a snapshot of how we've organized the data. The data is by county. Um, we prefix all of them with the Tampa Bay Regional Planning 
Council, and then we say GIZ. So this is Citrus County. We just use the last three, uh, the first three characters of the county. So we, if it's Hernando, it's going to be underscore H-E-R, or Hillsborough is going to be H-I-L. And then we've named them so that you know each county, just so you download everything, you cannot exactly which one pertains to your county. Um, and so as you can see there, we've got a ground DEM. Um, we've got the depth grades. So DEP stands for depth. Um, and then we also got the existing quilts, which is based on our new mapping. And then we've got the NFHL. Um, we've dated it so that since the NFHL is being updated, you know, if the Loma revisions or FEMA does any kind of physical map revision, we want to make sure that there is a date footprint of the currency of the NFHL that was used. And then we've got the WSE, the water surface elevation grades, the 500 year and 100 year. Um, and then we just had a base um, that I layer that is from um, the state of Florida, um, GIS data library, the counties, um, just in case somebody wants to look at that. Um, we also develop the metadata, um, which is just, you know, most people don't really worry about it um, until they actually need it, uh, but it's just a way to just describe the data sets that you are receiving, which year was created in, the coordinate system, um, what am I looking at if I see, for example, a flood zone, what does this mean? I mean, things like that. So it just gives you a quick description um, of the data when it was created, whether it's going to be updated every year, things like that. And so if you hit the next slide, this is just a snapshot um, of what the metadata looks like for each county. And so we did develop this for each county. So each county have their own metadata, but the structure of the metadata is the same, except a few things that changes. Um, and so just a good idea of, you know, this was sponsored by TBRPC. This is when we submitted it. This is the web link. We've got some documentation of the abstract and the purpose of the data sets. If you click on the um, next slide, um, I've got a few more things about some of the sources of the data that we are using. Um, so everything new that we created based on the current terrain, um, we source them as steady one for this particular study or project. And then the NFHL have their own um, you know, effective dates. Each county's effective date is different. So we want to make sure that we remember that so that if the data is or the tool is used to map next year, you know, in a few months when the NFHL has changed, um, we'll be able to document that too. And then these are just descriptions of the data sets that um, we do have in the geodatabase that we are submitting. Um, um, so I, I think that's that's all for the metadata um, for the project documentation on all the regional data sets. Um, so we, we are hoping that this will become a very good regional base wide data sets that can be leveraged and used. And again, it's a quilt. It is not for regulatory purposes. It's just a non-regulatory product. Um, the good news is, like I said, it can be leveraged for so many scenarios on some of the things that I talked about, how they can, we can leverage it for um, either getting your base flood elevation very quickly, how to explain the extent of mapping to residents, that you, you might be on the fringes of a floodplain, but your actual flood rigs or your depth at that area could be about six inches of water, you know, when it rains. So just finding a way to communicate and get residents and other people within your jurisdiction to understand how the flood rigs is changing um, based on current conditions. So I'm going to turn over to Sam to talk about the tool itself and how it can be used um, to map other data sets as they become available. So over to you, Sam. So uh, Sam, uh, just got a message from Sarkar. He says he's, uh, he's okay. lost his internet. <laughs> All right, so I will, I will continue then. Talk so, through it? Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, so really when we started, the main goal again was how a tool can be made readily available um, and leveraged to map existing modeled back data sets um, where they are available. And so we, like, we look into how it can be developed. We um, work with the region and we, it was decided that we do everything within an ESRI environment, ArcGIS. Um, and so since they were moving into um, a new environment called ArcPro, um, we did that. Um, and the good news about that is it gives you an environment where you can map on a region-wide level because it maps on a bigger engine. And so instead of mapping stream by stream or watershed by watershed, you can map at a county level and get region-wide data sets if you need to. Again, the two um, leverages 
old data. Um, the way we structure the tool, you can map um, flat planes, elevations, and depths. And then once you are done, you can clean it up um, because usually once you map, it will, we create what we call raw flat planes. And then the sanitized flat plane tool helps you to clean it up um, and make it usable, to put it that way. Um, it leverages the spatial analyst engine and the 3D analyst engine um, of the um, Esri Act Pro environment. And so anytime you want to run it, you want to make sure that you have those extensions checked um, so that it can, it can run for you. Um, it, because it processes a lot of flat planes and um, it's massaging, cleaning, erasing and stuff. Some of the tools require you to have an advanced license. So make sure that once you are creating the tool, you've got that advanced license check to be able to uh, map with it. Um, next slide, please. So um, these are screenshots um, of the tool. So when you click on the tool to map, um, this screenshot comes in, the tool leverages both raster and vector data sets. Um, of course, you want to have your terrain available. Um, so any data that comes in raster or vector format, which are the two main um, GIS data formats that we have available, it can leverage it. Um, and so whether you're mapping 100 or 500, which is the most commonly available data set we have, um, it can leverage it. If the data comes in, as long as it's in the GIS format, vector, points, line, polygons, or raster, great format, um, it will be able to leverage it. Um, and so it consumes that information. You want to be able to supply it your terrain first and everything else is based on the terrain. So if your terrain resolution, for example, is 10 meters or 30 feet, all your graded products will be created at that 30 foot resolution. Um, so for this area, when I began, I said we created a mosaic grid at 10 foot resolution. So all our data sets are created at that resolution. And we are going to provide a mosaic DM to the counties um, just in case they want to reference and use it too. Um, and so it goes through a process that we call Rasta um, intersection. Um, so before it does that, it creates um, tains, you know, triangular regular networks, and then it create rasters, and then does that raster intersection to create flat planes. Basically, that's what happening behind the scenes. The tool also does some of the mapping principles that we do, like creating bounding polygons, finding ways to map um, according to a certain depth, um, depending on the circumstances. Some people want to see, for example, what's the mapping looking like when I want to look at you know, six inches of flooding. And so the tool has that flexibility where you can specify um, the depth of flooding that you want to look at to map. Okay, go to the next slide. Um, so this is just a graphic of, um, on the left side, you see some of the effective data. You see cross sections in red, um, the existing mapping um, that we can see. And then once you begin to map, um, you are going to see this is this is a great data set actually on the right side in the blue showing on the right side. So you can see how the tool is outputting the mapping. And then, you know, depending on how the mapping is com coming out, um, you can decide that you want to clean, which we call the sanitize tool, like refine the polygons a little bit. Um, we've got certain thresholds that you can clean your map into. Um, generally within the um, FEMA best practice, sometimes we use what we call the two acre rule. So if you've got you know, disconnected mapping across everywhere um, that are not connected, and if it's not sheet flow or ponding, you, know, you probably want to you know, remove those. Um, and sometimes the flat plane managers or the planet just want to see where water collects when it rains. And so they may not decide to even sanitize it at all. They want to see everywhere that there is mapping. And so you may not have to even run the sanitized flat plane cleanup tool. Um, go to the next slide, please. Um, again, we want to emphasize that it's not generating new flood data out of nowhere. It's everything is just based on whatever you feed into it. Um, and so you want to make sure that if you are feeding data that is in metric, for example, um, you're changing it to feet because all our terrain elevations are in feet. Um, otherwise, your depths are going to come up and you're going to wonder why you are getting high um, flood depths within your mapping. So just make sure that you are, all the data inputs are consistent with the kind of output you expect um, to see when the tool runs. So um, again, this is another screenshot where I talked about you know, sanitizing the flood plains, um, whether you want to clean it by a two acre, you can specify, you know, there's been instances where we've sanitized them with 0.5 acres because 
That's what the community wanted to see, or that was a requirement by the state. Um, you know, the threshold of your debt. Um, sometimes you just want to clean it by zero. You just want to see where everything maps. So you just put in zero, it's going to map everything for you. Um, you want to see where, for example, for example, it's going to rain. Um, you, there's a forecast that is going to rain heavily. There's going to be a big storm event. And as a planner or a floodplain manager, you want to see where you want to put their low water crossings. You want to see where you're going to have, for example, six inches of flooding or more. So you can just say, you know, map at 0.5 feet or more for me um, so that I can see where I have to take, you know, workers in and block the road. So this is just a quick way where you can, you know, change the inputs and then use the tool to generate outputs for different uses really um, for depending on the scenario. Um, so here is, here is another um, quick snapshot where we are showing on the left side where this is raw mapping, you know, it maps everything. Um, and on the right, we've sanitized and cleaned it up a little bit. So you can tell that, you know, some of the disconnected polygons, you know, some of the small flooding along roadways, things like that, that are just, you know, less than probably 0.1 of, um, of mapping or depth are being cleaned out and you sort of clean it up a little bit. And one of the advantages too of cleaning up the flat plane so that it becomes more usable because as you begin to deal with countywide data sets and you're doing vulnerability assessment, you want to be able to quickly run GI spatial analysis with all this data inventory, whether it's a parcels building, um, roadways, um, critical facilities, emergency facilities, and know which ones are going to be affected by flooding. Um, so if you clean the data set, it helps with some of your other processing for vulnerability assessments so, so that you can get quick um, outputs from. Next slide, please. Um, so one of the things that we've as part of the tool delivery is documentation. Just like we did for the, you know, the flat plane mapping that we've developed, we want to make sure that it's documented. This is where the mapping came from. This is what we expect the data to be used. It is not regulatory, it's non-regulatory, it's just for flat wrecks, and that's all it is. Um, same thing, we've tried to create a user-friendly documentation, a step-by-step -step flowchart on how to be able to run the tool. Um, and so we have flowchart, we've got screenshots, um, all to help with running it. There's all kinds of metadata. When you click on a tool, it pops up with all kinds of metadata so you can see or be able to tell what the tool is doing. So um, other resources that we plan um, to do before I move, um, I give this slide to somebody else, is the ability um, that you know, once new data sets come in, um, you can be able to leverage them easily to run the tool. Um, one thing that I forgot to mention was, for example, when you're doing vulnerability assessment, um, you want to put in depth. If you want to understand the consequences of flooding, you know, how many buildings will be, you know, inundated um, in terms of depth or how much trash you have to plan for, depending on how many trees you have, you need depth grids. And so, this is a great way where you've got depth grids available. You can quickly run um, another tool for that's available for female called hazards to really know the consequences of mapping. Are you going to have some possible injuries or depth when there's a particular storm event? It helps you um, be able to run those with other flood depths and grades that you have. Um, so the data is going to be available, and we are hoping that the um, the future data sets, the sea level rise data set will also be um, available this week for download too. So I'm going to turn it over to Gary Moore Sean to take over for technical assistance. Hey, Sean, um, you want to wrap it up? Yeah, absolutely. All right, give me one second. All right. So in terms of next steps and, and what we're expecting, you know, in terms of wrap up. So everything associated with this project from task one all the way through task four is required to be submitted to the TBRPC by May 26. So that's coming up extremely soon. We're already there. Um, the all of the deliverables and project materials will be reviewed by the TBRPC for final comments and revisions. And then final deliverables will be submitted to FDP for review and approval by June 1st. 
By June 30th, the FDP grant period and contract between FDP and the TBRPC will expire. So FDP will have approximately a month to review all of the final materials and give a final seal of approval. After the deliverables are approved, the TBRPC is planning on publishing all of the project materials in GitHub for user manuals, video tutorials, code, et cetera. So this webinar is recorded. It will be made available at a later date. And there will also be a SharePoint for zip files of project data sets. So any of the data that you are hoping to acquire, you will have the ability to access a folder and download those materials. And then there will be additional ArcGIS online resources. Um, and then beyond this project, obviously across the Tampa Bay region, uh, governments are conducting vulnerability assessments as we speak. And then there's also coordination between FDP, many regional planning councils and other entities uh, to improve how GIS and data is coordinated across the state of Florida and how all of this relates to vulnerability assessments. Moving into the future from a water resources perspective, um, you know, some of the things that we're going to be looking at over the next few years and the state of Florida will be looking at are the variables of compound flooding, high tide flooding, rainfall, and riverine flooding. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, emerging trends and an emerging space in this area, and we're looking forward to seeing how that all evolves. So with that said, you know, moving into the rest of our agenda and uh, the time that we have remaining, uh, we'd like to give stakeholders on this call an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, there will be someone who can provide answers on this call, and if not, we can follow up with you. Uh, but please use the, hand, the, the raise hand feature to uh, voice your questions, and we will call on you and go from there. But thank you very much for allowing us this opportunity to share this presentation. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing for a moment, and we have Mr. Alan Biddle coming from Pasco County with his hand raised. Hey, Sean, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Um, right, so excellent presentation and looks like excellent work. I um, appreciate this very much from... Uh, Regional Planning Council and DEP and 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 your project team. Um, so, um, my question is, as you mentioned, as you just mentioned, um, as we speak, there's a lot of vulnerability assessment work going on. A lot of us local governments are either in the middle of it or starting it up or redoing, <laughs> to some extent. And and what I'd like to know more about or perhaps put out there for discussion is, okay, how, how, how is this work, these results uh, going to help us as we're either in embarking on or in the middle of a vulnerability assessment? Um, is it going to reduce the amount of work that might have otherwise been required on the part of someone, some consultant, who can who can answer that? Yeah, I can I can take a first uh, stab at that. So the um, you know, the the regional inundation coordination effort really tries to put a lot of these data sets into one place for the entire region. So it hopefully it'll be a one stop shop for whatever is available today. We're not producing any new data i.e. we're not doing hydraulic modeling to create new maps, but what, what is available, what we were able to compile, we brought it um, into one place. Uh, the other thing is there's some data that we were able to create that did not exist before based on existing data. So for example, all those depth grids, those depth grids have been really created for the entire region from, from Citrus to, to all the way down to Sarasota. And so they were created using a, um, you know, the same approach using a high resolution um, uh, top, uh, topography. And uh, I think that those, you know, you just, you just download them and you can use them for your planning purposes. Uh, like we've said a couple of times uh, earlier, you know, these, these data sets, and we obviously, we didn't have 
the opportunity to review every nook and cranny uh, in the in the map, right? To verify connectivity and the like. But um, using the data that is available, using you know, you know, technology, using GIS tools, we were able to create these maps, these depth grids, which were not available everywhere. Uh, we also created some of the uh, future data set. So um, future data, in this case, for the coastal environment, looking at storm surge, added to the uh, sea level rise projection. So we we don't know what the me meteorology is going to be in you know 20 years or 50 years, right? So what are hurricanes going to look like? What is the intensity going to really look like in 2070? We, we have a lot of uncertainty to to, to, to make that uh, that assessment. So what we did and has been done in other in other areas was just added the two, right? Put together storm surge that we know today, that we know of today, and added it, added the um the sea level projection. It's just a it's just an addition. It's not the real um you know future flooding, but it's an estimate that allows for for planning. And we created depth grids out of those. So it's not just the addition of the water surface elevations, but we created those depth grids. All right, Guillermo, thank you for that response. And thank you, Alan, for the question. Um, we also have Mark Murphy with his hand raised. Yeah, hi. Um, I was just a little confused. It sounds like um, you guys built this tool, which looks very nice. Um, and forgive me, because I don't really do a lot of the planning. We're just purely GIS folks. So maybe there's bits of this I don't understand. But it sounds like you guys have done a lot of the analysis, like uh, you know, taking the, the regional inputs. And it sounds like you guys have run this analysis for the various counties already. I guess my question to you would be, it looks like you're also providing us the tools as well so that we could run the analysis again in the future. Is that correct? That's correct. So the tool is, um, you know, it's a it's a geoprocessing tool uh, built in Arc Pro. Uh, I believe we use uh, Python language, but we use a lot of the tools that come with with uh, uh, the Arc Pro uh, environment. Uh, we created the interface so that, and we created a, a user's manual. Uh, Angel's team created that user's manual, uh, and so you can follow the steps to import the data that you have with say water surface elevations and you import a, a topography and the tool will be able to spit out that mapped uh, product you know the the limit of inundation or the extent of in inundation as well as the um uh, the depth so it's really a, a great um uh how can i say um I mean, it's a, it's a tool. Any really anybody with some GIS knowledge can can use it, can run it. Um, of course, there has to be some 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 knowledge, I guess, of uh, floodplain mapping. Have to be some you know engineering knowledge about you know how to create uh, how how to interpret those maps. But beyond that, the tool just ingests the data and then sp uh, spits out uh, a result. Um, should be really useful for areas that lack any data at all today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just curious as to like in the future, where would we get these updated data sets or what? Again, it sounds like you guys have worked off of the 2018 LIDAR and I'm assuming probably the most recent uh, FEMA flood maps that came out and, and so right. forth. Correct, correct. Yes, I mean, future, uh, future studies, right? Uh, where are they going to come from? uh <laughs> different sources i guess but uh yeah the, as the data gets created if it hasn't been mapped we can use these these tools um it can be i mean the tool itself can be used in different ways now where the data comes from is uh, is a different question i guess different grants maybe okay. <laughs> yeah and those so, like you said those tools will be available like end of july or i mean end of june june 30th, it, yeah about. Right, they are they are available. Uh, we'll make sure that uh, you can access them. I mean, we should be able to access uh, to provide a link so you can download them as, as early as this week. We'll just follow uh, Ashley and okay. Gareth's uh, lead on that. So, Angela, were you going to say something? Sorry. Yeah, just an example from Mark. Um, I spoke with Dr. Tom Fraser yesterday, who heads up the Florida Flood Hub at USF St. Pete, and he was saying how it, we, we heard him, you know, present at the Tampa Bay Regional uh, Leadership Summit about 
they're creating the sea level rise projections and he has a consultant creating the GIS mapping. So if you wanted to create those into flood depths, you'd be able to take that GIS map and throw it in, throw it in here. So I think what Mark's question was, is how would we use this in the future? What's gonna change? If we had new LIDAR or if we had new sea level rise projections or new flood maps, you could change that. And I think we're gonna see new products being produced by the state in the next year that will be really useful here. Guillermo, I just wanted to add one thing too, is that, um, you know, like for Alan's use case of he's in the middle of doing a vulnerability assessment, like the data sets that you all have created covers Alan, like Alan will be ready to go in July when we get approval from FDEP. But, you know, to Mark's point, like this tool would just, you know, extend the work that you all have done to new projects or new guidance from the state. So I just wanted to make that point especially for Alan. So he knows that he's good to go. Thanks. And uh, Alan has his hand raised again. I think Jessica had hers up first, so let her go first. Okay, thank you. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I was just wondering, is there a way I can send this, uh, my, the Energy and Sustainability Department for Manatee County is doing a vulnerability assessment. Is there a way I can send this video to this recorded video to them so they can um, also be a part of the information if they need it or contact somebody if they need help? Yeah, the, the video is being recorded. The TBRPC, when it is made available, uh, most likely via YouTube. Is that correct, Ashley? Yes. So, um, so once the YouTube link is posted and made available, the TBRPC will most likely send out the link to everyone who has copied on this email as well as others. So stay posted for that. Okay, because I think I got this invite was um, forwarded to me from somebody, but you guys have all the information in the meeting chat, so I'll be able to get a, uh, I'll get the email. Yes, correct. Thank you. Appreciate no it. Thanks, Jessica. So back to Alan. Yeah, thanks. Um, actually, I have two more questions, if that's okay. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Um, so, oops, sorry. Um, uh, Pasco is talking to Pinellas and Hillsboro about um, new LIDAR data collection, uh, um, a whole new another LIDAR data set uh, mapping, you know, another flight to be done. Um, probably, probably wouldn't happen until sometime into fiscal year 24, which for us starts in October. Um, so we're talking about that now, trying to figure out how to budget it, how to put it together. Penelope is in the lead. I don't know if everybody knows about that. Um, if not, this is your heads up. Um, once that's done, how? what are your thoughts on how we combine, how we get this new lot of data or other data as it comes available after you complete this work? Um, I don't know if that question makes sense. <laughs> well, if you're a GIS uh, person, you probably, you know, it's probably a no-brainer. I don't know. Um, Sam and uh, Sean, I mean, feel free to to jump in. But let me ask you, uh, Alan, what is the motivation to uh, collect this uh, this uh, new round of lidar? I mean, are you concerned with changes in the ground, or uh, maybe you just want high resolution of that? Um, topographic uh, description I think, it's, or what? I think it's I think it's both uh, I'm not a lidar expert but what I'm hearing on some of the phone calls I think it's I think it's both I think it's uh, changes and the age of the old right. data and also resolution right precision. yeah so I mean lidar when it's collected it's not it's not perfect right and as technology evolves and we we have new tools and new ability to store larger data sets and all that then we can grab that data and you know uh, process it with higher resolution um and then the end product is is better right um like you know a lot of a lot of designers civil engineering designers they stay away from lidar because it's not as reliable where you have some canopy and something so um if you if what I would say is if they know what are the areas that um, have significant changes, then definitely you know run it through the tool and see what the you know what the new depths are. And if there's a significant change, then 
maybe some changes may come from that, right? Maybe some different, I don't know, I'm, I don't want to get into the flood map, but at least for mitigation and planning purposes, maybe there's some uh, some some new information that comes from that, but it's that that's all it is, right? Uh, new topography, it cre may create a slightly different mapping. Uh, I'd be surprised if the uh, if the mapping is very different, right? If if there are areas that are very very uh, very wrong in the previous lidar, but uh, I don't know that. Sure. Okay, good. Um, my next question, if I could go on, has to do, take you back to, I'll take you back to your slide 19 uh, when Sam was talking and um, it he brought up something that is a question I always have because we have a variety of different engineering teams. Uh, like in utilities, we have utilities engineering, and then we also have uh, a whole engineering team in public works uh, that works on everything from roads to stormwater and watershed projects. Uh, and our whole bevy of consultants that help us with both of those areas. Um, and part of what Sam said is that these data sets, and it's on the slide, actually, I copied it. These data sets do not replace FEMA regulatory flood maps. And these flood data sets must not be used for engineering design. So, um, so when I'm talking to my engineers, I might get a comment like, well, what does that work, meaning your work? What does that work do for us? What is that, you know, is that something that we can use or how can we use that? So uh, I'm not an engineer, I'm a hydrogeologist. Um, so my question to you guys, and maybe especially the engineers on the call, whether it's on your team or some of the county, city county engineers, if they're on there, is, um, you know, how does, how do you see, what's your, what's your vision on, how your work, how these results can be used by engineering teams, if not used for engineering design. I think I get that. Yeah. Um, what's your view or vision on how it, how it's going to be used, or how yeah. what's what's the optimization here? What's the value added for the engineering teams? Right. So I think you know, as an engineer, I would uh, I would look at this data and think of. Um, you know, the first cut, the first idea of what the risk is and what is, um, you know, like a, like a, almost um, on the feasibility uh, level, you know, what what do we know about that area already? So sometimes, you know, we, we start a, a, a project that uh, in which we, we know nothing about the risk, whether it's from, from the coast or inland, whatever the source is. This, these data sets already tell you what we know um, in a, in a, in a good way, but we did not go into every every line that we produce, every depth that we produce, and um, and QC it because obviously it's, it's such a large area. Uh, so we can't say everything is um, you know that nothing is, uh, is 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 missing. How can I say uh, just the uh, the accuracy of some of those hydraulic connectivities? You know there may be some canals, culverts that lidar does not show as connected. So. When we map it, they they become disconnected. So some some areas like that, we uh, we went through it and and try to map it, um, clean it up, and, and and give it a uh, you know um, just just a review for that connectivity. But but it was just not possible to go through every single county's uh, uh, mapping in this case. Uh, but it's definitely something that you can download, put into a map, and you can start making decisions from that point on. Um, and then you take it from there. I don't know if anybody else uh, has a different uh, idea. Yeah, uh, let me let me see if I can add to it. So I'll, I'll, let me speak to you from a user perspective. So for example, you can have LIDAR data in an area, right? You just mentioned that they're collecting new LIDAR for a few counties and I understand because you know the current LIDAR is 2017, 2018. 
things change, the built environment change. Let's say there's a fill in an area, the new LIDAR might capture it. So there's always new LIDAR data collection. But even when you collect that data and there's going to be an engineering project, in addition to the LIDAR, the engineering project is going to send field surveyors to the field to take in better measurements. So they're going to leverage the LIDAR, but they will still need field survey because of the accuracy of engineering to get more measurements to their engineering. So in the same way, I see this data as planning level data, just like you've got overall data, it gives you an overview of what's happening. But if I want to use the data for detailed engineering design, then I need to go into more detail to get to do the analysis. Another example is, you know, we're going to do an H and H study. You know, we usually walk the stream, take pictures, look at the vegetation, a few things here and there. But then afterwards, we actually send surveyors to the field to do the actual engineering measurements for our bridges, structures before we run the model. So our initial data that we go to collect working the stream was just to give us a snapshot of, you know, how the stream is, you know, how the flooding is happening in the area and that kind of thing. But then afterwards, there's a the new details that the surveyors go and add more information to it. So really, yes, I mean, they can look at it, but with a caution that they can use it for engineering design. You know, they can have an idea of the extent of the mapping, the depth that I experienced there, you know, and have an idea of how to be doing something with some of their planning documents and things like that. But if they want to actually go into the details, then they have to, you know, do a detailed analysis to yeah. get the work done. Yeah, and, and just to add just to add to that, uh, um, and, and um, slightly separate notes, you know, they do not replace, when we say we, they do not replace the, um, the FEMA data sets, you know, FEMA's data sets, they are regulatory. So to adopt them, they have to go through a whole process of you know, due diligence and they have to go through an appeal period, et cetera, et cetera. We're not, we're not doing that. So they're definitely, absolutely not replacing what FEMA uh, published, right? So um, it's the same data, it's the same elevations, just mapped a little bit different. But even if it's you know, more accurate mapping because we're using maybe updated topography, uh, they cannot replace the FEMA's maps unless they go through a, a process. Now, for example, you were talking about uh, the uh, interest of collecting new LIDAR for, um, for PASCO because they know there's been some changes. Then, you know, you, you can remap that area based on the new LIDAR and then go to FEMA and that, that, uh, change the maps. And, and one of the other benefits um, to put it in there is um, you know, I don't know how many communities here in the CRS program, you know, the FEMA CRS program gives you certain discount depending on how much more communities have done above and beyond the minimum NFIP requirements, which is the FEMA maps. So this is an example product where communities can leverage it as part of their CRS and get more points and hopefully we'll get them to a point where they get discounts on their flood insurance. Because now you've got whistle grid, debt grids, all those count as additional points when you're submitting to CRS. So this is a, a product where it's going to add you know, to your CRS submitter where you get more points and you might reduce flood plan insurance for people by about 10 to 15% when you are able to complete your CRS application. Yeah, can I add something to that quickly? Sorry, I'm yes. back. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> so, no, to add to what Guillermo and Sam has been saying, you know, um, what this product or these products provide, they're another line of evidence, basically, you know, on at the high level where your flood risks are. I think, you know, it's not quite base level engineering. It's probably two steps below that. But again, you know, base level engineering products, you would never use that, you know, for a design purpose. It gives you a high level risk and it informs, say, if I were the city engineer, I would take a look at it and say, OK, these look like the problem areas in addition to other evidences. So I need more detailed studies in this, this and this, this areas. So that is how I think this can be a tool uh, for the engineers who are asking you, how is this, how is this going to help me? So. Uh, you know, that is another use that I can think of um, for these products beyond, you know, uh, helping with vulnerability assessments. Again, it's a high level risk um, product. Uh, it's not a regulatory product, but it, it has its uses in the uh, engineering realm too, uh, 
um, especially from a line of evidence standpoint. Like, you know, I get complaints from this area and, you know, some, someone told me this area floods. I have some CCTV footages. I have this, uh, you know, mapping product that tells me the same thing. So I think I need to do a more detailed study in this particular area and see what the problem is. So. Okay, well, that's great. So that's that. Those are all good answers. Uh, I, I kind of knew the answer before I asked the question, <laughs> to, to be honest. But I think it was it was worth putting out there for the benefit of the whole group. Um, you know, in Pasco, uh, I I reside within the public infrastructure branch of our org chart. Um, our vulnerability assessment and resilience project is managed in a different part of the org chart out of the planning and development department. Um, that department's made up of almost, it's mostly a majority of planners, right? We have some engineers, but majority planners. Um, but I have to bring together the engineering teams from utilities and public works in my branch with the planners and planning and development department and the work on this project, on our project, vulnerability assessment and resilience planning project, um, have to bring them together and just make sure we're all on the same page. And that's and that's where my question comes from, you know. So um, includes our county surveyor, right? Our county surveyor says, "Yeah, GIS is great. It stands for Get It Survey." Yeah, um, nice. <laughs> so, um, so you know, I got to get everybody on board. So that's you know, anytime I can ask a question like that and get additional input, that's that's where I'm coming from. All right. Very good. Awesome. That's all. Very good. Very good. Yeah, it always it always uh, I mean, it should be a first layer of uh, reasonableness. You know, you uh, you look at the data that, that we produce and that is a reasonable, um, uh, you know, assessment of, of the risk of flooding in this case. So very good. All right. Are there any other questions that any folks have? And my apologies for turning my webcam off. My internet started lagging out as well. So what I will add to this discussion uh, based on what was just stated, you know, one of, for, for those who are not necessarily, uh, you know, super interested in the, the data aspects of the GIS aspects, there's a lot of grant funding available all across the country right now, especially in the state of Florida to advance implementation objectives. And the Resilient Florida program, at a minimum, has $100 million available for design and construction activities. So one other purpose for this tool or something to think about is if you submit a grant application for an implementation project to FDEP, it has to be supported by data and analysis. And after 2024, it would have had to be identified out of a vulnerability assessment. So this is one other purpose. Um, it can be used to kind of prioritize projects, identify projects and support the actual grant applications themselves. So there's a lot of uses. These are all things that local governments have to be thinking about. Um, and the TBRPC is always on standby to help with those requests. Um, so just you know, emphasizing that. So one final opportunity, any remaining questions? And if not, that's great. So um, I'm going to share my screen one last time. Give me one second. All right, so on behalf of the entire TBRIC team comprised of the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council, HAF, Taylor Engineering, and the University of Florida, uh, we would like to extend our gratitude and appreciation uh, to all of the stakeholders, the many stakeholders who participated in this process, this, this project would not have been possible without you all. So thank you for your feedback. Thank you for your input. Thank you for the collaboration. And moving forward, what we're excited about is the consensus that will hopefully be achieved over the next few years as you all continue to conduct these types of assessments. So we hope that the resources made available through the TBIC project are valuable and useful to local needs and priorities. And if you have any questions about any components of this project, uh, Guillermo can be contacted. His email's on the screen, my email's on the screen, and then we also have Karen Ashley's email. Uh, but any questions at all, any feedback, if you would like to get in touch with, with us for whatever reason, uh, send us an email. We can definitely set up a meeting. 
Um, but with that said, stay posted for a webinar link uh, to be made available through YouTube. And before we get off, I just want to provide one final opportunity to uh, Crystal from UF, Angela from Taylor Engineering. If you all have any final comments or just uh, you know best wishes for the stakeholders here. Thanks, Sean. I mean, I'd like to just applaud the leadership for Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council for having you know the thought leadership to apply for this grant, DEP to fund it, and you know I think the key word in this T brick is C for coordination. And I think that's kind of what we've been discussing here is, you know, coordinating cross counties, just like Alan talked about Hillsborough, Pasco and Pinellas coordinating. And I think just having one regional view of flood inundation is really just going to help just have more robust planning level flood scenarios. So I appreciate the leadership of TBRPC. Crystal. Thanks, Angela. I couldn't agree with you more. I think uh, TPBRC Great idea, great execution. Half, you did a tremendous amount of work in a short amount of time. And I think all the products you all produce will be really valuable for the region. Um, and I hope to see people using those regional data sets. Those are really a remarkable uh, resource for the region. So glad to be part of this. Thanks, Crystal. I also see, I also see Katie, who I didn't see before. <laughs> if you want to say any final words before we close out. Yeah, I, um, you know, I think I agree with everything that Crystal said. It's been um, fun to be a part of this and a tremendous amount of work has gone into this in a really short time and, and things are looking great. So thanks. Thank you. Well, really appreciate it, everyone. Um, and, uh, you know, we're really excited about what the future holds in store. So uh, with that being said, we're going to formally conclude and adjourn this meeting but we hope everyone has a fantastic week and a even better summer. But thank you very much for joining this webinar and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you all.